Okay, we're recording. Hi there, everybody. We are here, and this is the book, Brian Solis's new book. Brian's new book is kind of fabulous, and we're going to interview him. We've got two other amazing people here. I'm Marsha Collier. I, I've been here forever. We've got Heather Meeker Haas, who's the co-founder of Meeker Quinn, has an amazing background on the web. Shelly Kramer, a 20-year marketing veteran who pretty much knows it all. And <laughs> Brian Solis, wait a minute. He's got like this awesome bio. Wait a minute. Brian, <laughs> he's, like, oh, <laughs> he's globally recognized as one of the most prominent leaders in business innovation. As a digital analyst, anthropologist, and futurist, he studies disruptive technology and its impact on business and society. Brian, is that impressive? What's really scary <laughs> is that we have this group of four people, and we have about 80 years of marketing experience. Oh, God. Us, right? <laughs> Marcia, like 20. Come on. Well, times four, right? I know. Right. Exactly. Exactly. We're not so, old. So, Brian, I took a look at this book, and thank you for sending it. It's not your average book. When I open it up, it's got amazing short form content, which reads a whole lot differently than a lot of the books I've seen. What made you write this book in such a different style? Uh, it, it was, um, it, it wasn't my first choice, trust me. It's, uh, it's like that old Blaise Pascal quote, I, uh, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had more time. It, it was just because it was ironic that I was telling you that the world is changing and that we had to think about experiences and designing them for a new world. And I was going to tell you that story in a book. So I took the challenge and thought, how, how would you reinvent the book for uh, for a digital economy based on how we use our smartphones and Tinder and, and Flipboard and all of these new apps where we pinch zoom and swipe right. And I thought I, that why not study people? Uh, and do exactly what the book says. And I read the book to apply the book to the design of the book. Now, will this book appeal to your average business guy, or is this for the more digital savvy audience? It, this is where uh, I really think the magic of the book uh, shines in that I wrote it for digital savvy executives, but then I rewrote it because when we talk about experiences, that's that's anybody everybody needs to think about experiences especially small businesses uh, and and entrepreneurs and startups and enterprises alike because it takes a it's, it takes a human-centered approach to the whole subject and so i had to bring it down to a level that was approachable but still usable uh by by everyone including i i was also inspired by artists because i thought you know hey we live in a new world where you can't just sell music or art you have to sell ecosystems so i thought about them too well, who was the art director for this book? Because no offense, Brian, I don't think you did all this. <laughs> Actually, I, I was the art director. Uh, really? The yep. Uh, but I did work with uh, my friends at Mechanism, so they okay. they they executed on on all of the all of the design. But it, I studied. Uh, it, so here's a funny story. The books. It's a lot of people are going to call it a coffee table book, and I'll totally take that as a compliment. Um, but it, it's it, what it really is, and here's the secret of this, the story: is that it's a it's a it's an analog app. Uh, so it is designed to look, feel, and even be used like you would uh, a regular app on your mobile device. Because uh, I studied UX and UI, uh, and so all of the things that are placed, how they're placed, how many sentences are in a row uh, until you have white space and, and visual, uh, visual storytelling, it's all designed to bring a digital experience on paper. So uh, it, it was not just art directed, it's completely UX. Well, before I turn it over to Shelley and Heather, uh, since I write for Dummies Books, would you explain UX and UI? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so user experience is the intentional design <clears throat> of how somebody interacts with something, right? And I'm just trying to bring it down to the basics. It's a, it's a very complex and beautiful um, discipline. But, uh, for example, um, the way that you use uh, a Tesla, uh, it's the, the, the car itself is very UX'd in that 
the door handles are meant to sink in so that it applies a much more aerodynamic design and motion. But once you're inside, it's completely simplified with just one screen and only the instruments you need in order to be a much more navigable uh, and drivable experience. Uh, and then you get into UI, which is user interface. And so, for example, what you see in the Tesla screen, the icons, the placement of the icons, that gets into user interface um, design. Uh, so the book sort of takes from that sort of the layout of the pages, uh, the, the the length of the chapters, the size of the of the book, which is an iPad Air. Uh, the uh, and then the UI is all of the um, as you notice. There's a lot of iconography. There's a lot of uh, very simple headlines with arrows and lines kind of pointing So in a you. nutshell, you made it so it'll look good and simple to read by using the graphics. And psychologically promote <laughs> page turning and learning. There you go. Shelly, well, you're up. Yeah, Brian, I'm a, I'm a UX freak, so I love everything. And, and by the way, I bought this book because I'm your good friend. Um, oh, thank you. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and I know that that's what authors really need is people to actually click the buy button. So I did that. Um, but I'm a UX freak, and, and we do a lot with clients. Um, we do a lot of breaking apart of website experiences. We do a lot of buyer persona work. We do a lot of telling brand story work. Um, and what I find, and I know this won't be any surprise to you, but hopefully this will be helpful for our audience. Um, what I find is that you know businesses today are still very much creating experiences based on the old status quo. And so a website looks like this because this is what it's always looked like and we're gonna tell the story that we want people to know about our company even though it bores you to death and we're going to publish on the first page of our website all the press releases that talk about how awesome we are and so there the examples you know you could you could find a hundred examples in 30 minutes of companies large and small doing just that and instead today I think what we're really looking for when it comes to great design it is all about creating great experiences and so when somebody comes to your website whether you're a B2C company or a B2B company when somebody comes to your website what happens is an intuitive experience and they know right where to go and they understand exactly what you do and you know we experience this all the time when we're buying something from a website and somebody you know the gap remembers who I am unfortunately Unfortunately. And, you know, I spend way too much money there because I have nine year old twin girls. But, you know, the, every part of my e commerce experience with them is easy and intuitive. And, oh, by the way, if I leave something in my shopping cart, they remind me. And all of that is, is, is user experience that's built into a web, a digital experience. Um, and, you know, I was looking at your quote from Rebecca Cox great design is all the work you don't ask people who use your product to do. So, so Marsha, that, I think that's a perfect definition of what user experience is because you don't think about this when you're creating an experience, but what are the exact steps that you're making somebody go through to buy your book, to opt in for a download of a white paper, to, to buy something on your website, to um, create a contact form on your website. So it's all those things, all those hoops that you're asking people to jump through is really what UX is all about. And I don't think we think about that enough as business people from a design standpoint, from a content development standpoint, and so on. So I, so I love the topic. I think you're spot on, Brian. I think this is stuff that people really need to know and use and learn. Well, you know, I think I, I'll look at, uh, I'm, I'm reading the comments at the same time. First of all, I noticed that you're wearing the Apple Watch. And I think that it is, an elegant example of what you ask people not to do uh, in terms of the complications of technology, right? I think the best technology is the most invisible technology. Uh, and that's the most complex, but the, the, the most beautiful of, of user experience design. Uh, and Thomas Marzano, uh, who I see is, is in the chat, uh, he, he, he does know this, but a lot of people don't know this, that he's a head of, uh, of experience design at Philips. Uh, based in Amsterdam, and he played a very instrumental role uh, in in the design of this book uh, because it 
Yeah, when you when you look at what experience means, there's there's not a lot of uh, real official definitions. There's there's specific definitions of user experience or customer experience or uh, brand experience, but when when you look at um, just what is an experience, there's not really a lot there. And I thought there was going to be a lot to source from when I started writing this book three and a half years ago, but I felt like, wow, uh, am I going to have to invent this stuff as we go through it. And the only way to do that was to borrow from all of the great disciplines like user experience uh, to try to elevate that message to the executive level, but then bring it down to a little bit of a more human uh, approach saying, it's not just about websites, right? It's for life. It's you know the experience that someone has, it's an emotional thing, right? And you feel it and you react in a certain way. And if you think about that in every moment of truth from the website to e-commerce, to physical commerce, to customer service, uh, all of these things act independently. And when we talk about experience, which is why the book is just called X, they all share the letter X in common. So what we want to do is, as Thomas is saying in comments, it's the limbic brain. Yes. So what we're talking about is limbic resonance. So it's the idea of designing an experience that goes with you, that carries with you. That's an experience worth having an experience worth sharing because you, you would, you actually design it to peel to the senses. And so I borrowed from all these disciplines as a way of saying, Hey, you can't just market. You can't just be creative. You can't just try to talk louder or spend more money or be more viral. Um, you can't just offshore your customer support to save money. You have to rethink the entire customer experience because people don't want to do business with you if you are not acting and feeling like the way that they use Uber or the way that they use all of these other services that remind them that they're the most important person in, in the universe. Well, so, think, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. Real quickly before I forget, I think that what you're saying is that your own, your brand is only as important as how you manage to make a customer feel about you. And, and I think that that's so important because in today's world, uh, I think that a lot of us buy things, whether you're buying things on Amazon, whether you're, you know, sometimes we just, we don't even know who we're buying things for. We just need something. So we find what we need and we buy it. And I think that you, you are very much as a business in danger of being commoditized if you don't understand how important it is to create an experience that resonates with your customers so people understand and remember, I bought that from those people and they are so awesome. They were awesome before I bought from them. They were awesome while I was buying for them and they continue to be awesome after I've already made a purchase. I am a customer for life and that's and you, you have to focus on that today, I think, or else, you know, become. I, I think you're absolutely right, Shelley. One of the things I said, whoa, Brian, what, f five years ago, that marketing is empathy now. You have to be empath. The empathy you have for your customer is the first step, and you can take it from there. You know, so I, I'm just kind of geeking out being here with y'all um, this morning because this is this is this is exactly right. I, in the, I think the first page of the book says, uh, "Experience is the new brand, uh, and shared experiences are the new marketing." Uh, and it's the idea that you have to first be relevant and significant enough. Uh, in every aspect of it, not just product design or not just service. So experience becomes everything. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, as you said, Marsha, I think empathy is is the secret. I mean, and Shelly, as you know, empathy is, is one of the big, big absolute disciplines within user experience. But I think the closest we get if we try is sympathy, right? Which is not the same thing as empathy. Uh, so sympathy might make us say, we need a mobile site, we need to be responsive. But empathy would say, well, what's the point of a website in 2016? Uh, how is that gonna affect, uh, how is that gonna relate to and, and enhance the, the customer journey? But here's, here's the challenge, and here's what the book set out to do, is, is we, have to, we have to recognize that there are a lot of great examples of really great aspects of business. Certain products are the best, certain customer service is the best, certain marketing is the best, but none of that shit is stitched together in a way that matters outside of those moments. Uh, and it's very, very rare when you can find that type of an, an intentional uh, design or intentional experience. So I, I call for the need for people to rise to what I call experience architecture. So that the future of business, the future of brand, the future of customer service is the sum of all of these parts. And someone has to think about, hey, what do we want someone to feel and do 
and share in these moments? And then how do we use technology? How do we use design? How do we talk? How, what are the processes that we could use or, or reinvent to bring these experiences to life, to reinforce them and to positively condition people to not just be part of a community or be part of a customer base, but to actually be part of the brand. Uh, so it's a real magnificent time, I think, for all of us because none of this stuff is written and we could apply all of these things to design an entirely new genre of relationships. Well, I think Heather has been, well, Earthlink, Yahoo. Heather's been everywhere and I think she's had a really close up close look at empathy in the customer. So Heather, I'm gonna throw it to you now. You asked Brian some questions. Well, you know, Brian, Brian and I have been friends for a long time. And I remember a while back we were discussing your book and and if I'm right, it was much larger, correct, in scope in the beginning. And then you kind of you kind of narrowed it down to this focus. And I'm just curious what the inspiration was for the book. And then also you know, I know that the book can apply to anybody within an organization, but it, who is this book best suited for in a large organization where I feel like you've got the heads of customer service and sales and marketing and PR and everyone's kind of coming together. And I think a lot of times we do get siloed in large corporations. As Marcia said, I've worked for several in the past and everyone's kind of doing their own thing. And it's really hard to bring the company together around this idea of an experience. Um, so can you give us a little bit of insight as, as to how you could take this book and really apply it at a larger company and, and apply your ideas and principles? Yeah, so, so nothing about experience architecture is meant to be easy, right? Because it, it, if, it, if it was easy, then anybody and everybody could do it. Uh, this is why all of the data shows that anybody who invests in experience, uh, it, it becomes a new competitive advantage uh, moving forward. Uh, the thing about the disparate disciplines that you talk about is that there isn't a catalyst to champion this all the way up to the C-suite, right? Uh, so while we all believe in delivering better customer experiences, we're trying to do so in also disparate ways. Uh, and so if you invest in better customer service or better customer support, well, I, I can almost guarantee you, and I know Marsha would 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 agree with this is that they're going to do so based on the legacy of how they view customer support it's all based on old school approaches practices metrics budgets uh, yet nobody that you know likes to call or contact customer service <laughs> so <laughs> this is the last thing i want to do <laughs> yeah, exactly. right and there's there's even a new service called at service which is an app designed to call contact support for you wow. uh, so that you don't have to deal with the anxiety and the pain of that right yeah. but the point is is that you can't you can't design an experience by basing them on legacy uh, frameworks this is why this is an entirely new opportunity and 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 I think marvelous for all of us because we're going to rewrite history uh, and rewrite the future is that we have to start by questioning everything. So PR, marketing, customer support, product design, all of these things act in silos because that's the way the business models are designed to 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 allow them to do what they have to do. Um, it's not until we start to take a step back and say, this isn't working. Uh, and if we're going to redesign something for the future, if we're going to be innovative, if we're going to be relevant to a different type of customer in the future, technology aside, just absolute relevant, uh, we have to rethink our approach. And so in the book, I, I, I use examples to get people to shift perspective. Uh, and I even had to go through this. And uh, that was, for example, asking simple questions like the things we take for granted in life. Uh, every time you use Word, you click a diskette to save, right? But some of us know that that's a diskette. Uh, half of society thinks it's a save icon because they've never yeah, seen it. I thought a it was a save icon. I, I know what a diskette is, but hey, it's control S in my world. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or the remote control, right? Like that's 60 years of design evolution that just effed up over and over and over again because it kept iterating rather than innovating. Uh, and these are all things, yeah. You know, the average number of buttons on a remote is 70. They have gotten progressively Same. worse. Um, with with new technology and so we we take the same thinking that goes into the remote and we apply it to the future of customer experience or the future of customer support or all of these things we just keep basing it on previous foundations when in fact this is a time for radical innovation now experience can start small we just have to find for example where are there where is there friction right and there's friction everywhere and all of those things take away from the experience so starting by fixing that 
we can then learn ways of working with people that we don't <laughs> that we don't talk to or collaborate with today. But at some point, the whole aspiration of what an experience could be has to has to be supported at the top, uh, executed all the way down and all the way throughout all of this stuff. So it's it's almost like a new regime of leadership is needed. So it's a big, big, big complex thing about change. But I could tell you that the stories I tell within the book are of companies that are going through this and how they're going through this and why they're going through this, uh, because it's inevitable. And this is why we have to relegate sort of this, this appreciation that yes, change is hard. Not everybody's going to be up to do this and not everybody wants to change, but it's, it's no reason we, we can, we'll just say, oh, okay, <laughs> oh, <but laughs> you're that's, right. That's what makes it so exciting, though, because when you get this and when you can adapt and really focus on the experience, that becomes your competitive advantage. Because as we've yes. seen, whether it comes to social or the adoption of content or the adoption of rich media content, all those things, you know, the brands, big and small, who get this, and who integrate these things into their business operations see uh, see a competitive advantage. And so I think when I when I look at things like this, I get excited about it. Not because oh, I, I think it's cool. It's the newest, bright, shiny thing. It makes sense. It absolutely works. And when you can figure out a way, as a and I'm a brand strategist, so when I could figure out a way to get my clients to focus in on these things, I know that it gives us a leg up. So. I mean, you know, that's what you're looking for when you work with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to win, and I want them to win. Well, so. Yeah, it's pretty much adapt or die. Heather, have you found this with your clients as well? Right, absolutely. And I think that, you know, Brian, to your point, and the organization, I'm almost wondering if this is a new role within a company to bring everyone together. You know, there are go-to-market teams and there are companies that have someone that, that – within the organization kind of pulls everyone. I've done that role before, you know, you're working across the organization to launch a product, Shelly, to your point, keep the brand consistent. But I'm almost wondering if this is a new role within an organization. Well, somebody has to have uh, the vision and, and somebody has to have uh, leadership and, not, and someone else has to be able to execute uh, on this stuff. When I was doing my research on, you know, what is that role? I, I, found that some some folks were calling themselves the chief experience officer or uh, some folks w right. would take this up under the chief digital officer. But I, w I will tell you this, though, that every aspect of, of anything involved with experience, uh, whether it's from design or whether it's physical product or, or whether it's processes or, or service infrastructures, whatever it is, it all needs to be rethought uh, and reimagined and someone has to lead that. Now, um, I'll tell you something though, that it's not traditional management skills that are gonna do this. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just leadership from the motivational standpoint, because I could tell you that when I was looking at great leadership, it, it, was, it was also aligned with things like inspiration, motivation. Uh, what, what we, we need is, is, is vision, um, you know, and, and courage and things that aren't necessarily celebrated as, as much as they should be. So for example, um, I was watching a video uh, in, in, uh, in the development of this book from Steve Jobs in 1997. It was just some re, re surfaced video that hadn't been released before and the quality was horrible. Uh, but th there was a, a heckler in the audience who asked him a question, said something like, you know, you've been gone all these years. I think this is when Steve Jobs first returned to Apple. You've been gone all these years. What makes you think that you're going to uh, save the company basically? Uh, and he, he sat there in silence for maybe a good seven seconds, right? And that doesn't seem like a lot, except when you're watching it, you know, and you're in the audience. Uh, and he uh, thought about his answer and he said, you know, the thing, the thing about this is that you can please some of the people some of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then he takes another long pause and he says, look, the thing about this is guys like this are right, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, the kind of change that we need to make is the kind of change that isn't just about great products or great revenue. It's the kind of it's the kind of change that's led by vision around a bigger holistic experience, right? A, a, a holistic vision that makes the sum of all of these products build up to something that's great, that builds markets, that changes markets, and then that you know, and of course, you had to get into revenue. But what you're saying here, Brian, is you take all this vision, you combine it with experience. And to make it simple, best practices, and you take this vision and you can just shoot up a volcano. 
and make great I, change. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> but, you know, in um, everybody talks about Apple uh, or Disney or the usual subjects when we talk about experience. But, you know, the thing about the thing about Steve Jobs um, was that it it was all intentional. Right. So he was the chief experience architect. And I asked, I don't know, every, about 100 people, you know, hey, what, what do you think? Uh, why do you love Apple? And I, I don't think I ever got really a, a consistent set of answers to say, like, this is why Apple is a great experience. So I dedicate an entire uh, chapter, which is 8.1, where I spent a good year going through the entire iPad ecosystem, you know, uncovering uh, what it's like to go through the journey, uh, their messages, their videos, their stories. Uh, I found job descriptions. I found training manuals. I, I talked to the people who were responsible for designing boxes and testing boxes. And I started to find a narrative. I found a narrative uh, that was that aligned with the story arc, believe it or not, that every aspect of the iPad universe was designed, uh, not only designed, but designed to work together. And then every touch point was designed to be reinforced against that story arc. And it was beautiful. And so I reverse engineered it. Uh, and since Thomas is here, uh, not that I'll give away the ending, but it's it's called an experience flow uh, in some cases. And it's also what Philips does. Every aspect of the experience in terms of the box design, the websites, the shopper journey, the usage is all architected so that it could be magnificent. Well, you know, you and I have been going to Comdex, remember? Oh, wow. And there was Seabold <laughs> conferences before that. And I met Steve Jobs and he sat there and he explained the next computer to me. Really? I, wow. Yes. And I remember listening to him and he was just a very intense young man who really believed in this product, but he had the original elevator pitch. That man could sell shoes to oh. Heather. <laughs> she could sell ugly That's shoes hard. to Heather. <laughs> That's not hard, right? But we're on our half hour now. I'd like to go around everybody. Let's make a final comment so we can archive this and get it on the web. Well, I'll start. You know, um, I, I don't say this a lot, Brian, and, you know, we, we all have many friends that write lots of books and everything else. And, you know, I was talking with a friend the other day. I've got, actually, Marcia and I might have been talking about it. I don't remember. Um, you know, I've got libraries and bookshelves in my office of business books that friends have written that I haven't read. Um, so in all sincerity, this is one that I haven't yet read, but it's on my desk. And, and I definitely, I mean, this is definitely stuff that I'm interested in. And I think, it, and I, and I love how you've talked about it. I love how you teed it up. I hope our audience feels the same way. Um, Dave Thackeray and Thomas Marzano, I really appreciate your input here. You guys have been awesome. So, um, so for all you who are listening, get the book, buy the book, read the book. <laughs> you like it. And by the way, Brian's not paying me to say that because that's not. Uh, I feel like I yeah, should. Yeah, you bought the book. I feel like you should too. Yeah, Heather. No, I was just going to reiterate the same thing. You know, I was just sitting here and I was thinking about um, what makes an experience great. And I've, I've been lucky in my career to work for some amazing leaders that really bring this vision of this entire experience. And I see companies um, grow like as a result of that, just by having that person's presence at the company. Um, I have old bosses that are head of, you know, product design of Expedia and Uber, and I see these companies thriving. So I know that what you're, um, what's in this book, Brian, does make the difference between a wonderful experience and a fantastic experience. And I agree with Shelly. I, I, I would go get this book if you work within an organization. I think everyone could benefit from this advice at all levels in the organization. So thank you for writing the book. And Brian, in the end, I think you say it all on the back cover. Most executives and entrepreneurs neglect the value of designing experience from the onset. They talk, build, and sell around it while still missing it. By reading this book, you can find the best way to apply X to your business. And I want to thank you, Brian, for writing it. I'm enjoying reading it because I don't have to read it straight through. My favorite books are the ones you can hit and run. That's the way I write mine. And I appreciate <laughs> that you wrote yours this way, too. Wow. Well, I just want to say uh, you, you've all made my morning. Uh, this is wonderful to be surrounded by friends. And, you know, I, I know that we we've all been friends for a very long time and I'll just, I'll just sort of leave the, uh, the everyone with just some honesty. Uh, there were many times where I, I 
didn't think this book was going to come out uh, because it's not just radical in terms of its design, uh, but it's also radical in terms of how do you make a book like this, you know, in full color, thick paper, different size, uh, no table of contents, you know, uh, at, come out at a price point that's equivalent to the average business book, right? Because it was easy to do this at $100. Um, and to get a publisher, to convince a publisher to build a whole new supply chain and infrastructure around the book, uh, a whole new process for producing the book, uh, all of this stuff. And even eight weeks before the book was coming out, we were feeding paper through printers because the, it kept jamming through old old processes. So every aspect of this book had to be reinvented. And I only went through this pain uh, because it's experience is possible. Experiences are mandatory and it requires a complete transformation. And so I, I went through this in an empathetic approach as a way of demonstrating that we can all do this and we all need to do this. So thank you everyone for listening and for your support because, oh my gosh, it means, uh, it means everything. Well, I'll be following up on this with a, embedding this on my blog with a little point of view and maybe a quote from Heather and a quote from Shelley. I want to thank everybody, Nancy, Ralph, everybody out there, Adams Consulting, Diana Adams, everybody who's been here to support this chat. We love you. Hey, it was my first lab. And hey, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brian, for being our guest. Thank you, Shelley, for joining in. And thank you, Heather. Thank you, everybody. And stopping the recording. Nice to see you. <laughs>